anatomy, biology. Mm, yeah, kind of that study of, a yeah, family history, but botany. Yep, all of those types of things, okay, would be considered biological sciences, ecology, all that kind of stuff, okay? Psychology, um, I'm not really sure where that fits. That, that typically fits into what's called a social science, and so it, it, it's not really categorized, I don't think, into, or categorized into biological or physical. But yeah, that's a good thought. All right, I'm going to give you the big kind of textbook definition of chemistry here, and I want to I point out just a few things, okay? Um, did I give that to you as the fill-in-the-blank type thing? No? Okay. So it says, chemistry is the study of composition, structure, and properties of matter, the processes it undergoes, and energy changes that accompany these processes. Okay, so there's a couple highlights that I want to I mention here with, within that definition. Um, I won't ask you to memorize that definition or anything like that, but I want to point out just a couple important parts, okay? It says that chemistry studies the composition of matter. The composition of matter. What does that word composition mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Composition means what it's made of. So in chemistry, we're going to study what makes up matter, right? What is it that makes up a certain compound? I study the composition of matter, which means we're going to see what is it made up of, right? What is it that makes all the different things that make up our world? Um, we're going to study the structure of matter. So what, tell me a, a different word for structure, or a different definition for structure. What's that mean? Just kind of shout it out. What do you think? Yeah, go ahead. What makes it up? Uh, not necessarily what makes it up. That's composition. So the structure of it, yeah, what do you think? Kind of, yeah. Kind of, yes. We're in the realm, yeah. Mm hmm good. All of those things I would agree with. Structure is kind of how it fits together, okay? So we're going to know what it's made of, and we're going to know how it comes together. All right, that could mean like the shape of molecules. That could mean the patterns in which we see to which things fit together, right? You'll notice in chemistry, you'll start to notice a lot of things in chemistry that, um, and in physical sciences in general, right? Our goal as a physical scientist is to really define the patterns in nature that God's laid out, right? That we are, we, we know that the universe was created with, with intention and with, patterns for us to discover, right? That's what our, what we're trying to deal with in the natural world is, is understanding those patterns. Um, and you will see in chemistry, there's a lot of patterns that happen. There's a lot of tendencies, a lot of rules. Um, and all of those things come, um, not by, not by accident, right? The, the creation of that was not random. Okay. So we're going to study the composition, the structure, and then the properties of matter. So what's another word for properties? It's a word I don't feel like it has a lot of synonyms, but what do you think? Yeah, Maddie. Okay, kind of, yeah. In my mind, I'm thinking like characteristics, right? Another thing, yeah, what, is it, what does it look like? What's it feel like, shape, shapes like, look like, smell like, all those types of things, okay? So we're going to learn all about how matter comes together. The processes it undergoes, that might mean um, when it gets heated, when it gets cooled, when it transfers energy, all that kind of stuff, and then the energy changes that accompany the processes. When we study science, um, specifically chemistry and physics in general, um, the main point, like the driving force behind all that we study is energy change, right? How is energy being changed or transferred from one thing to, a net, to another? Um, and we can transfer that energy a lot of different ways, but if we had to boil down chemistry and physics to like a topic, right? It's pretty much how energy is transferred, how it's moved. Um, and so that's really the, the big point here, okay? We're going to learn a lot of different skills that go with that, but that's kind of the main, main point, okay? Listed below here are just some branches of chemistry. So if you would go on um, and study chemistry in specifics, you could, you could get into a whole bunch of different um, avenues of chemistry. And I'm not going to break these down a whole lot. Organic chemistry studies all molecules that have carbon as its base, okay? Inorganic would be the opposite of that, molecules that don't contain carbon. Um, physical chemistry 
has a lot to do with um, the things that we kind of study, but more in depth. Um, it has a lot to deal with, um, yeah, just the, I'd say that's the most general one. Analytical means we're looking at analysis of, of different objects, right? We might be analyzing samples of things. Um, biochemistry, what, do you, what would you guess? Just based on the word, what would you guess biochemistry does? Chemistry. Yeah, chemistry of living things. So biochemistry studies a lot about the processes within the body, right? Glycolysis, things like that. Um, that's biochemistry. And then theoretical chemistry uh, is, again, similar to what we're doing now, right? We're kind of doing theoretical physical chemistry. We're, we're taking big concepts and we're, we're mapping out what would happen, right? What could happen. Okay, um, we're going to break down two main ideas here in chemistry, an atom versus a molecule. Can anyone tell me the difference real quick before we get too much into it? What's the difference between an atom and a molecule? Yeah. Uh, an atom is just like a kind of single thing, mm-hmm. and a molecule is made like a Good, good. So all matter is made up of tiny particles called atoms. Um, an atom is the smallest part of an element that is still the element. So let's figure out what that is what that phrase means, okay? And we're gonna talk about that here in just a second, but a molecule is when two or more atoms are chemically bonded and are acting as a unit. Do we know, what are, what are the even smaller parts that make up an atom? They're called subatomic particles. Do you know what are those small parts called? Mm, they start with a P. Oh, protons. Good, protons neutrons and electrons, right? That's my abbreviations for protons, neutrons, and electrons. Can anyone explain to me why I might abbreviate them that way? Why P with a plus? Yeah, shout it out. What do you think, Ethan? It has a positive charge, right? And neutral, I'm sorry, neutrons have what charge? None, right? They don't have any charge, so it's a little zero. And then electrons have a E negative, they have a negative charge. Okay, so that's, you'll see me abbreviate protons, neutrons, and electrons that way. Sometimes I even forget the zero and I just read an N, right? But that's what essentially protons, neutrons, electrons. So here's the thing. Why don't we call those atoms? Why isn't a proton the smallest part of an element? Because protons by themselves don't contain characteristics of oxygen or silicon or zirconium or anything like that. In order to be an atom, you have to have a certain arrangement of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and that gives you a certain set of characteristics or properties. So we we can say an atom is the smallest part of an element that is still the element itself, right? It has to have those characteristics. If we just pull out one proton and say that's an atom, well, that's not the case because it doesn't behave like an atom right? It doesn't behave. It doesn't have characteristics like a single atom. Okay. So an atom is the smallest part of an element, but it still maintains the properties of that element. Okay. Would we feel good about the fact that all these up here are elements, right? This is called the periodic table of the elements. So all of these things are elements and that's what we know the world is composed of, right? As of this point, that's what we know the world is composed of, these particular elements and combinations of those elements make up our entire world. Okay, but each of those elements have very specific chemical and physical characteristics that are determined based on their proton, neutron, and electron arrangements. So the smallest little tiny subatomic particles define the way that these elements behave. Okay, so we got to know that an atom is the smallest part that can't be broken down, right? It's the thing. A molecule is two or more atoms that are chemically bonded. That's important. They're not just hanging out next to each other. They are chemically bonded, okay? And so in order for for atoms to be chemically bonded, do you know what has to happen in order for a bond to take place? Do you remember, have you talked about chemical bonding at all? Maybe a little bit. What has to happen uh, for a chemical bond to take place? Uh, No, even more broad than that. What has to happen with the electrons? Okay, so in order for a chemical bond to take place, the electrons have to be shared or traded. Okay, electrons within those two atoms have to be shared or traded. And once that has taken place, then we would consider those atoms chemically bonded. And now they're a a unit, a molecule, right? Two have become one. But that's what we're looking for here is that you have to have some sort of electron transfer. Uh Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. 
Yep, otherwise it's not a molecule, then it would still be an atom. Yep, yep. So here we have an example of water. Water's formula, chemical formula, do you know what it is? H2O. H2O, good. So here we can see an oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms, okay? And what you don't see in that particular picture is the bond that is taking place, right? But what's happening in this molecule is that electrons are shared, okay? We will start to figure out and see the pattern as to when we know uh, electrons are shared versus when they're traded. We'll talk about how do we know which one's going to happen and which type of a bond, but that'll be later, okay? But important part is that it has to be chemically bonded. All right, so there's, oh, okay, blah, blah, blah. This is talking about water, but we just talked about that. All right, we, we know that water's formula, we said, was H2O. Okay, so when we had water, it looked like that. How many hydrogen atoms were there in water? Two. Two. And how many oxygen atoms were there in water? One. One. So if there's no subscript there, we assume it's a one. Okay, so let's see that again. h 2 Oh, if there is no subscript that follows that, we assume it's a one. And if it's a one, we just leave it off. So do you know what I mean when I say subscript? Sub means below and superscript would mean above. So that's where we normally put it if it has a charge, okay? But subscripts laying below. So if we had an oxygen molecule, that means these two oxygen atoms are bonded. We would write that as O2. If we had a hydrogen molecule, that would be two hydrogen atoms. It's written as H2. Okay, so that subscript right here, subscript tells us when there's more than one atom in that particular molecule. So for water, we saw two hydrogens bonded to one oxygen. Okay, we feel comfortable with how those are laid out. Okay, so if I had a molecule that looked like this, C6H12O6, right? That's what? Glucose. Glucose, good. So what, how many carbons are in that molecule? Six. Six. How many hydrogens? Twelve and oxygens, six, right? Just looking at it, we don't necessarily know their arrangement. We don't necessarily know what everything's bonded to, but we know that's at least the makeup. That's the composition of the molecule, okay? All right, um, a chemical reaction takes place when one substance changes to another by reorganizing the way atoms are attached to one another. Okay, so a chemical reaction takes place when one substance changes to another. A big thing I want you to know about chemical reactions is that something new forms. Something new has to form. Okay, if something new does not form then that means we didn't have a chemical reaction take place, okay? We just had a physical change take place, okay? So in this particular reaction that's listed down below, it's listed in picture form, but I'm gonna write out what it, what it might look like, okay? We have a water molecule here. We actually have two water molecules, one, two. It says via an electric current, an electric current was pulsed through those water molecules and it split them into an O2 molecule and two H2 molecules. So when we write that chemical reaction out, it would look like this. Two H2O yields O2 plus two H2. Does that look familiar? That structure of a chemical formula look familiar, chemical reaction? Okay, so I wanna point out a few things in that chemical reaction that are gonna be super important for us to, to know and be familiar with. First of all, can anyone tell me what's that arrow mean? Any idea? It means, okay, good, forms, makes, yields is the technical term for it, but produces or even equals is how you can think of that. You can think of it as an addition problem, right? And that's really your equal sign. If I put these things together, I'm going to get these out, okay? So this means yields. Okay. On the left side or the starting side of my reaction, this group of materials on, that I start with has a name. Do you know what those are called? Reactants. Reactants. Very good. These are called the reactants. 
and it's anything that sits to the left of the arrow is the reactants, and then anything that sits to the right of the arrow you think is called a what? Product. A product, very good, a product. Okay, we can have any numbers of combinations of reactants and products, okay? We're gonna study chemical reactions pretty in depth um, in chapter three, but I wanna give a brief kind of overview. Do we feel good about what those things are called? Okay, the last thing that I want you to be familiar with right here is uh, this guy and this guy. What are those called? They would be called the same thing in algebra. If I had 2x. No, they're like, um, constants. Mm, what's the 2 called? Uh, coefficients. Good. They're called coefficients. <laughs> They are called coefficients. And so coefficients tell me how many of that whole molecule do I need, okay? So let's make a really quick distinction here. All right, I'm gonna make a real quick distinction. I'm gonna clear this off, okay? Do we have what we need on this slide? Okay, I want you to take a look at the difference here. Do those represent the same numbers of hydrogen atoms? Yeah, because if I have two times two, that would give me four hydrogen atoms. And if I have two times one oxygen, that would give me two oxygens. Would we agree with that? But do you think those represent the same molecules? They don't. So here's what's really important. If I know I need two water molecules, I cannot just make it H4O2. That, that structure would be completely different right? H4O2 would look like this. Oxygen, oxygen, hydrogen, 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 right? Does that look like water? No, right? It doesn't. So it would behave totally different. It's not the same formula, okay? So when we need multiple of that, when we need multiple of a particular compound, we edit using a coefficient, not a, not changing the formula itself. Is that clear? Okay, very good. So let's, let's look at this one again. Let's say I had a um, 3C6H4. How many carbon atoms in total would I have there? 18 carbons. And how many hydrogens in total would I have? 12 hydrogen, right? Because this coefficient gets multiplied, distributed through that whole thing. So it's almost like you've got a coefficient on the outside of parentheses, right? You would do the same thing. You're using that same math property to make that go all the way through. Is that clear? All right. Very good. Okay. Um, we're going to breeze over the scientific method here because I think this is something you hear like in every science class. It's probably fifth grade, right? And it's boring. Um, in science, we use a certain framework for gaining and organizing information. We call it the scientific method. Um, we put together a plan of action for processing and understanding our information. We're challenging current beliefs about science, asking questions, um, and to do that, we use the scientific method. Throw out what you know about the scientific method. Question. Yep, you have a question. You have a hypothesis, hypothesis right? What else? Research. You have to do research or collect data, right? What else? We analyze data. Yes. Yep, we do all of those things, right? All of those things we know about the scientific method. We're not going to go over um, a lot with the scientific method, but those are some of the things that you said. Here's what you do. You make an observation. You make a guess. You do your experiment, right? That's, that's bringing it and boiling it way down. But we can do this, those three essential steps in a sort of process. What if your experiment doesn't, doesn't yield the results you thought? Then you do it again, right? What if it does yield the results you thought? You still do it again, right? Because science, you, you, can't, you can't lend a conclusion or draw a conclusion off of one test, right? You've got to make sure that that test is repeatable, right? It's testable and repeatable. Okay, let's say you do this enough times. You develop what's called a theory, okay? And if you do it enough, enough, enough times, then it becomes what we consider scientific law, okay? Does scientific law mean it's 100%, a thousand times always true? Not necessarily. It just means we haven't proven it false yet, right? That's what it means. So chances are likely that gravity is really a thing, right? Would we agree with that, right? Gravity is a scientific law. Um, we have yet to disprove it, okay? Uh, is there maybe some other reason we all stick to the ground? Maybe, 
right? But it's probably still gravity, okay? But that's, that's the point, right? We have theories and what, what becomes laws because they've yet to be disproven, okay? People have tried, but, you know, when you find truth, it's true. Okay, um, a couple different things about collecting data. This is about observations specifically and observations and data. There are two sectors of data, qualitative data and quantitative data, Okay, qualitative and quantitative. Do we see the difference in those root words? Quantitative and qualitative, okay? So you need to know just kind of these two branches, okay? So qualitative means that we're probably looking at the qualities of something, okay? The intangibles, okay? Give me some examples of qualitative data, things we might see qualitatively. Shout them out. Okay. Be less specific. What are some things we might observe that we write down? Okay. Nope. I'm thinking of categories of qualitative data. Maybe I'm not asking my question well. Mm -mm. Color is what I'm thinking. Color is a qualitative type of data. What else is it? What else? Texture. Good. What else? Smell. Good. Yep. This is there. Yes, but hopefully we're not tasting too many things in science, right? Especially in our lab. But yes, I would agree. Color, texture, smell, taste. Okay, all of those types of things. Do you know why they're qualitative? They don't have a number. They don't have a number that goes with them. Okay? So that would mean quantitative is a type of, of data we collect that we measure. It, is a, it has a number. It has a quantity that goes with it. So qualitative means we're looking at qualities. Quantitative means it involves something we actually measured, okay? an actual number that goes with it. Okay. Let's see here. Um, I think this is models, theories, and laws. Okay, blah, blah, blah. I don't really want to talk about all that again. We already did. Okay. When we talked about taking measurements. Now we're going to move into taking and classifying measurements correctly. Okay. We said that any measurement is a quantitative observation considering consisting of two parts, which is a number and a unit. What do I mean when I say a unit? Feet, inches. What are some other ones? Mm-hmm. Grams, liters, gallons, all those types of things. So if we have to go back to the lab and say, I need, I need 0.44 grams of this. And you come over here and just write, it's 0.44 of NaCl, that's salt. I don't know. Is that 0.44 pounds? Is it 0.44 kilograms? Is it 0.44 grams? So your numbers always have to have a unit that go in the end. Okay. The unit tells us what the number means, right? Because without a unit, our number doesn't mean anything. Okay. So when, when we take measurements, we have to have the number and the unit. That's really, really important. In biology, that's not as much of a concern, but in chemistry, it's extremely important to have that unit with us. Okay. We're going to study now the metric system. Okay. In science, we, we use exclusively the metric system. Any idea why? Any idea why we use the metric system instead of the U.S. system? Does the rest of the world care about the U.S. system? No. no. They don't. Okay? If we send in information with scientific studies and say, it has a mass of 0.4, or I don't know, it has a mass of 13.8 ounces. They're like, I don't care. What an ounce, what's an ounce? Right? They have no clue. Because we're the only country that uses it. So they don't care about ounces or pounds or gallons or cups or pints or whatever the U.S. uses. Right? It's absurd. So the metric system is simpler, right? They have units for everything and then um, prefixes that tell you how big or small the unit we're measuring is. Uh -huh. Why did the U.S. like... Come That's a great itself? question. A great question. Yeah, it happened several, several presidents ago, but no, I don't know. 
Yeah, that's a good question. So when we use the metric system, here's what we call the base units. And, and I, I, the, the word base, maybe we're going to use that later. So we'll call these the common, maybe common SI units. SI stands for system international, but we call it the metric system. Okay. And we have seven, what we consider common units. Um, and here is the unit and the abbreviation that goes with it. Okay. These underlined ones are the ones that are going to be most important to us. All right. There's one unit out here that stands out to me, and I'm going to tell you it's that one. Tell me why do you think that one stands out to me in comparison to the others? Okay, it has a gram attached to it. Is that what you're going to say, Jack? What are you going to say? Well, it, it, mass and weight don't mean the same thing, but we'll get to that in physics. But they measure mass, how heavy something is. Okay, yeah? Good, yep. Yeah, that's where I think you guys are saying the same thing. But yes, that's what I think. Why is the, why is the common unit not just grams, right? Because grams would be the, the equivalent of meter, second, and mole, right? But it's not just a gram, it's a kilogram. And the only reason that kilogram is the most common unit is because most of the things in our everyday world weigh at least a kilogram, right? Gram is such a small unit. If you measured everything in grams, all of your measurements would be in the thousands. And so they use kilograms to make our numbers more manageable. That's the only difference. But if we're gonna call a unit the base unit, it would just be grams, right? Mass is measured in grams, but the common unit to measure it is kilograms. So that's a little tricky. That's the only one that's a little bit different, okay? All right, let's take a look at our metric prefixes. How comfortable are you with metric prefixes? Like at a, on a scale of one to five. Five means like I'm a master at metric prefixes. One means I don't even know what you're talking about when you say those words. Okay, just hold it up. I don't care what your number is. I just want to know. So not super familiar. Most of you are not super familiar. Okay, that's okay. All right, our metric prefixes are, are these guys right here. Giga, mega, kilo, deci, centi, milli, micro, nano. Do those at least like ring bells maybe? Okay. What they do is we apply those prefixes to any metric unit. We apply them to grams, liters, seconds, um, what's, I'm missing one, meters, right? We can apply those prefixes to any of those units to then make that unit bigger or smaller. Okay, so tell me right off the bat, do you know which one is bigger, a centimeter or a meter? A meter is bigger, you know that, right? So you know more about metric prefixes than you think, but a centimeter is really small. And so think about this, which is bigger, a gram or a centigram? A gram, right? Because how many centimeters are in a meter? A hundred. So how many centigrams do you think are in a gram? A hundred. Do you see how that prefix applies regardless of the unit? Okay, regardless of what ending we attach to it, it will be the same. Okay, so here's how I have the, the tables laid out. For me, I like to make my, my larger unit set equal to one. And then I'll say that how many of my smaller unit are present there? I don't like to say that one centimeter is equal to 0 0.01 meters, right? I don't like that. I don't want to use fractions or decimals if I don't have to. So I give the bigger unit the one. Do you see how those statements are equivalent? One centimeter is a hundredth of a meter, or I can say one meter is a hundred centimeters, right? To me, that works better. Would you guys agree with that? Okay, so that's how this table is laid out. I didn't put meters here, okay? I could have put meters, and it could say one gigameter is equal to one times 10 to the ninth meters. One megameter is equal to one times 10 to the sixth meters. I didn't fill in a unit because it applies to every type of unit. So where it says, where it has a little U, means I can put meters or grams or liters, or seconds, right? I could put any of those things in there and it would work the same way. Do we see how that applies to all of them? Okay, so I want you to feel comfortable with how we use these units, okay, and how we use the prefixes. 
All right. So if I were going to ask you how many milliseconds are in one second, what would you tell me? How many milliseconds are in one second? A thousand, right? Because I would come here and I would say, here's milli. I would say one second is equal to 1,000 milliseconds, right? That's all we're doing is applying those prefixes to anyone. Uh-huh. Okay. You'll notice that both of these units, oops, sorry. Both of these units right here are length units. Would we agree? Okay. So do I probably need to memorize both of those or only one of those? I would say only one of them because if I know how many centimeters are in an inch, but I don't know how many feet are in a meter, I can always convert from feet to inches, then inches to centimeters, then centimeters to meters, right? I could do a little bit more work, but I would be able to do it because I already know how many inches are in a foot, right? And I know how many centimeters are in a meter. So as long as I know one place to switch over, that's, that's probably comfortable, okay? Same thing with here. These are both mass one, so you can just remember one of those. And then this is a volume one, gallon to liters, okay? We'll use these enough that you'll start to get familiar with them. Um, you'll notice that for each of these, I gave the larger unit the one, right? Because I always like to say how many of the smaller unit can be found in the bigger one. I don't like to deal with fractions or decimals if I don't have to, okay? All right, the last little other common conversion factor, that's what, a, that's what these are all called, conversion factors. They help us convert from one to another, um, is that one milliliter is equal to one cubic centimeter. Okay, so let's, let's break that down a little bit. A cubic centimeter, you know what that is? It's a milliliter, okay, obviously, but a cubic centimeter would be the volume of a centimeter cubed. Right, so visualize a little tiny, teeny tiny cube with one centimeter on each side. The volume of that is equal to one milliliter. Okay, because how do I find the volume of a cube? You know yet? Length times width times height, right? So if I take one centimeter times one centimeter times one centimeter, I get a volume of one. And so one cubic centimeter has a volume of one milliliter, both volume measurements. Now, here's where you might hear this commonly in your everyday world. Um, I watched Grey's Anatomy for a long time, so I'm basically a doctor at this point, okay? But they say, I need 50 cc's of something. What does cc stand for? Cubic centimeters. Cubic centimeters. Because it's faster to say than cubic centimeters, or it's even faster to say, I need 50 milliliters of something, right? It just doesn't come out as well. That's, just, that's what you, when you hear that term cc's, that's what that's talking about, cubic centimeters. I know, I'm just blowing your mind, okay? Basically a doctor. We've walked through what is a measurement, right? Chemistry stuff. Now we're getting into taking measurements. And we are going to give kind of a few rules here in terms of taking measurements. And then we're going to get some practice with that, okay? I promise this is our last real kind of topic for today. I know you're hanging in there with me, so I appreciate it. Um, okay. When we take a measurement, a certain degree of uncertainty is expected because when we take measurements as humans, we're not perfect, right? We're never perfect, but we have to take a guess at some point, right? When we take a measurement, there's not a measurement we take that is exactly, exactly, exactly. We have to take a guess at some point. And so, a digit that we have to estimate in our measurement is considered uncertain, okay? A measurement always has some degree of uncertainty. It depends on the precision of the measurement devices. So here's what we're going to do. When we go take a measurement, whether it's with a meter stick, whether it's with a triple beam balance, whether it's with a um, graduated cylinder, we're always going to read what the instrument gives us and estimate one more digit. Read what it gives us and estimate one more digit. I wanna write that out, okay? I want you to write that out because this says it, but I don't like the way it says it, okay? We want to read what the instrument 
Oh, sorry. That kind of got away from me. Read what the instrument gives us and estimate one more digit. Okay, so I'm going to explain. We'll see what that means here in just a second. Um, yeah, so every single measurement we take should have one estimated digit, one digit we had to take a guess on. Never more than one, okay? Only one, never more than one. So I'm going to look at um, reading a burette. This is a, a volume um, cylinder that we use for... Um, making titrations and making solutions in a lab. So this says when we read a burette or any, any kind of vertical column of liquid, we read the bottom of the meniscus. Have you heard that term before? Bottom of the meniscus. The meniscus is the curved line that liquids make in glass containers, right? It has to do with surface tension and how that sticks to the glass. But we read the bottom of the meniscus. So we zoomed it in a little bit on the screen. I'm sure on yours, it's, it's pretty hard to see, but we zoomed it in here on the screen and we're going to read the, what the instrument gives us and we're going to estimate one more digit. So I want you to look here between, between 20 and 21, and this one counts down, there's 10 marks. So that must mean this is 20 point what? 20.1, 20.2, 20.3, right? It's all of those things, okay? So we know for sure this is between 20.1 and 20.2. Would we agree with that? We know it's for sure more than 20.1, but less than 20.2. So this right here is reading what the instrument gives us, and then we're gonna estimate on that last digit, right? That last digit doesn't have to be exact, it's a guess. But I think it's kind of splitting those two evenly. You might even say it's a little higher than that. I might even say it's 20.13, right? Or 20.14. But that last digit is estimated, so it's not a big deal if it's a little different, okay? So we know for sure it's greater than 20.1, less than 20.2, and then we make that uh, last guess. So our uncertain digit in this one is which one? The uncertain digit is the five, right? That's the one we had to take the guess on. All right, so let's do this first one together, and then I'm gonna have you make your estimations on the last two, and we'll see how it goes, okay? This first one is a graduated cylinder, so see how it counts up this time? We're between 20 and 30, so that means each of these tick marks is what? 21, 21 22, 23, 24. Okay, which are we reading, the top of the meniscus or the bottom? the bottom? The bottom. So we know it's for sure 24. Okay, and then what? 24 points. What do we think? I would say it's 24.0. It's right on the line. So we're going to say 24.0. Can I say 24.00? Mm -mm. Nope, because I already guessed on the zero, right? This one I already guessed on, so I don't get to guess another digit, right? Because this measurement tool is measured to the ones place. So I only get to estimate one more digit, which would put me at the tens place. Okay, let's go back and look at our last one. Our last one was measured to the tenths place, which means I got to estimate to the hundredths. Okay, do we see how that works? We read what it gives us, then we estimate one more. All right, you try these next two on your own. So I want a measurement for both of these devices. If it's easier for you to look up on the screen than on your sheet, you know, by all means, I, I, I realize that's probably kind of small for you on there. 38.0. Um, raise your hand if you agree. Is that about what we had? Good. And there's one more thing that we would have to tack on to the end. Assuming we knew the units was milliliters, that would be what we would put on the end. This one, it doesn't necessarily tell us, but we want to start practicing that unit. Um, how did we know it was 38? What do the tick marks go by? Two. They go by twos. We don't see graduated cylinders like that very often, but that's where I would go with that. Yep, good. Okay, Grace, what did you have for the next one? I put uh, 6.6, .6, and I wasn't sure if I should put a zero on the end. Okay, so what does everyone else think? What do we think? What did you put? Did you leave it at six or did you do six zero? Six zero. 
I did six zero also because we knew it was for sure between the six and the seven. So the zero is our guess. Yeah, that's a good good question. Okay, we didn't have any here that we had to take a guess on because they all landed on the line. But let's say we had one that landed here. Okay, uh, my line's too thick to make this look nice. But let's say we had that one. I would probably call that seven point seven six seven eight somewhere in there for in my view it's a little over the halfway point between those two tick marks would you agree so we're going anywhere in that range okay that last estimated digit you get wiggle room on there but that's really what we're looking for okay does that kind of make sense we feel good okay that's volume ones i've got some length ones for you as oh these are mass i'm sorry i've got some mass ones for you as well have you guys seen and used a triple beam balance before you know what i mean when i say triple beam balance 434, okay, we know it's for sure 434, but less than 435, and those tick marks are 0.2 grams, right, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, so I know it's more than 434.2, but less than 434.4, so I have to make a, a guess there, 434.4. To, I don't know, two two. two two sure. Okay, this one I think honestly gets a little sticky because technically the two was kind of this two was maybe a guess for us. So I wouldn't be mad if you left that one there. But our balances in here measure for sure to the one to the tens. Okay. All right, I'm gonna skip that last one. Yeah, go ahead, Maddie. I have like one more slide. Can you wait just two more minutes? Okay. All right. Last thing I want to talk about is two ways to determine your measurements. Um, and those are the terms accuracy and precision. Have we heard those terms before? Accuracy is close to the actual value. Accuracy is close to the actual value. So we want our measurements to be accurate, right? Because they should be close to what the actual value is. And then precision is how close together our measurements are. Okay, so we want our measurement database to be both precise and accurate, right? That's the goal, okay? Both precise and accurate. So I'm gonna show you some images here um, that kind of give us a reference point here. On the purple darts, do we see accuracy or precision or both or neither? I kind of think neither. Okay, because none of them are hitting the bullseye and they're scattered all over the place. Okay, in, in image B, we see these red darts all up in the corner. So what would that be? Precise. Precise, but not accurate. And then in the green ones, we see both accuracy and precision. Okay, so the way that we might have measurements that look like this, let's say we just read our meter stick wrong over and over and over again, right? It's supposed to be 42, but I was reading it as 32, right? And I wrote that down four different times. That's, that's an error in accuracy, but your, your measurements might be really precise. So that's just a way to think about that, okay?